The, uh, the session we're going to look at, uh, the topic we're going to look at in this session for the equipping hour, it's very fitting that um, we have the, the Bible on the wall. Did you guys see that out there? How could, you, how could you not see it? If you did not see it and got in here, then uh, we've got other problems. So um, It is just so incredible, so, so exciting to see that, and uh, it's just put up so well. Thank, so thankful for the guys who were working on that tirelessly this last week. And, um, you know, and I know that's been Smith's vision for a long time. You had that idea how long ago? Four years. So four years, four years ago, that was the idea. And uh, so it's very sweet to see the fruition of it. And I, I, all week as we were, you know, as I've seen it go up and as I was talking to the guys and thinking about that, um, I just kept thinking, well, how appropriate that I, I didn't even intend this session to line up this week, um, but how appropriate that we got that installed and we get to come in and see the Bible on the wall, and we're going to have time to just look at God's Word this morning, particularly on the topic of how the Bible alone produces a fear of the Lord. And so that's really what we're going to study this morning. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive in. Father, we're so thankful for this church. We're so thankful for the legacy and um, the history of, of how you have used this church, this congregation. We're so thankful for your word and the power that it um, gives us to, to know you and to fear you. And all of this, Lord, our, our love for this church, our celebration of the 20th anniversary, um, the fact that here this morning we have Many who are going to be baptized, we have even more who are going to become members, and uh, we have even more who are celebrating 20 years of your faithfulness through this congregation. And um, we just want to begin by approaching you with incredible gratitude, with um, just awe and adoration for doing what you alone can do. Um, Lord, we know that you have condescended to do everything that you do, and you do it so often through human means and through human instrument, instrumentation. Simply put, Lord, it, it's, I think we're all aware as we come to you that you could do what you do quite easily without us. Uh, we're, we're pretty aware, Lord, that knowing ourselves, if we, if we know ourselves rightly, that to do what you alone can do without us would be easier than doing it through us. And so the condescension that you show to use us in the lives of one another, to use your church, uh, to be a, a vehicle of articulating truth so that your scriptures could produce more and more fear of you in our hearts. This is um, staggering in and of itself. It's even more staggering that you would use flawed vessels to accomplish such a perfect work. And so this morning, we just come with hearts full of gratitude, and we also come hearts full of expectation, because again, it's our, it's our request that you would establish your word to your servants this morning as the very thing that would produce a reverence for you. And so we ask that so that you would get the glory and we would have the joy of fearing you in an increasing way. And for the glory of your son and for the welfare of this church, we ask these things. In your name we pray. Amen. Fear of the Lord. We've looked at what it means to domesticate God and become a little more complacent and too comfortable with the idea of God. And that's very common and typical in religious circles. We, we are very prone to do that as, as men. And we've also looked at what it is to fear the Lord and what it means to fear the Lord. Why the fear of the Lord is so distinct from all other fear, because it doesn't cause a fight or flight response. It causes a clinging to, a terrifying clinging to God and a clinging to his word. It causes us to approach the Lord, and, and it's consumed with a fear of dishonoring God and displeasing him, and it's taken up with this notion of pleasing God. That's what it means to fear the Lord. Now, if you've been listening to the series so far, you might be thinking, man, this is, hopefully you're thinking, this is something I need desperately 
uh, because that's the cry of every true believer is we all long to fear the Lord. And it's, it's the cry of every true believer to fear the Lord more than I currently fear him now. And I've often wondered, can I, is the fear of the Lord some sort of static thing? You, you, you have it or you don't. It's like a gene, <laughs> like a gene in your system. You just, it's like spiritual DNA. You just either have it or you don't. God saves you, and you, ah, how are you doing on the fear of the Lord? Well, I don't, I don't, that's not a high quotient in my gifting. No, it's not a gifting. It's, no, it's not a DNA. No, it's not a static element. The fear of the Lord is dynamic. What that means is, as we study the scriptures, we realize that the fear of the Lord is something that is birthed and grown and augmented by the Word. The Word of God causes the fear of the Lord, and the word of the Lord fuels it and causes it, to, causes it to increase. So the godly desire should be, you know what? I, I, I want to fear the Lord, and I want to fear the Lord more than I currently do. And so I think about that. Maybe you think about that in your marriage, or maybe you think about that in your parenting. Maybe you think about that in the workplace. Man, I hope my boys see a dad who fears the Lord Five years more, five years more, five years from now. And of course, it's not a direct correlation to time. We could have all the time in the world and not fear God more. It's a correlation to our relationship with his word. And so fear comes from the word. And I trust that you are convinced of that. And if not, I think our study this morning will establish that. But let me just ask the question, well, why can't it come from some of these other resources? There's, there's other areas that we might think that would cause us to fear the Lord more. For example, you might think that alarming circumstances might cause you to fear the Lord. Um, uh, I'm still, you know, I've only been in um, Arizona here for about six months, and I'm getting used to the area, getting used to, you know, just to what, what's unique to Phoenix. And so yesterday, I uh, took my son fishing. We went to Tempe Town Lake. And... Um, you all laugh. And uh, I, I've heard it affectionately called Tempe Town Toilet. And I found out why. And so we parked our, our vehicle. We unloaded the paddle boards. And as we're loading the paddle boards on, off the dock into the water, I hear a couple of the locals talking about the need to shower when you're done. And if you don't, your hair will smell, well, bad. And so uh, I took that to heart. Okay, wow. Okay, we're dealing with some. Uh, we're dealing with something here that's very special. We gotta. <laughs> we need to think. Steam this water. <laughs> I'm not too comfortable on this water. So I get out of my paddleboard, and you know, the la and the last time I used these paddleboards was uh, you know a couple miles from my house in Florida, and you know it was uh, salt water. I saw a lionfish. I saw a French angelfish, and you know, and so here we are in this water. And as I'm paddling, the first little wave that broke over the front of my white paddleboard was a, a water that had a hue and a color to it that deepened my conviction, I do not want to fall in. <laughs> you might say that the thought of falling into Tempe Town Toilet while paddleboarding, you might say that, that puts the fear of God in someone. <laughs> and I understand the idiom, I understand the vernacular, but obviously we know that, that, doesn't, that is ne there's no circumstance there's no experience we could possibly experience that would produce a biblical equivalent of fearing God. Not alarming circumstances, not even any personal experience that might be, as described in the Bible, exposure to God's person. And so if you remember, I won't turn here because these are passages that should be familiar from the series, but if you remember, we've already looked at the fear of God from Exodus 19 and 20, and the nation of Israel saw the phenomena, the manifestation of God's very presence on the top of the mountain, and you see an, a mountain shaking and quaking. It's like volcanic type activity with cloud and smoke and earthquake and fire, and it's just consuming and it's terrifying. And they were scared, but they did not fear the Lord. And so uh, the experience of the person of God is, is not enough to caused someone to fear. You remember Balaam. And Balaam did not fear the Lord. Balaam was motivated by a love of money. He, he was willing to attempt to curse the people of God no matter what means might be there in order to get rich from King Balak. And so 
after God has already said, you cannot curse these people, he's still on a journey to go curse the nation of Israel if there's any possible means. And the pre-incarnate Christ shows up on the way to stop him. He had a personal experience with the second person of the Trinity. By the end of the story of Numbers, he obviously was unsuccessful in cursing them outright, but he was successful in derailing them by motivating immorality with the um, Moabite women. And so when false doctrine and cursing and ruining the people of God in an outright fashion doesn't work, he took the classic tactic of impurity. These people experienced exposure to God's person. I remember as a kid thinking, man, you know what my faith really needs? My faith just needs like an experience of God. You know, I read these accounts of people seeing God in Scripture, and, and I, always, I imagined that. I, I think I was reading my Bible uh, on my bed one, one day, and, and I remember imagining, what would happen if the Shekinah showed up in my room right now? Imagining, you know, drywall combusting, <laughs> the ceiling just exploding with just the presence of God's glory, some absurd, unique phenomena, thinking, man, if that happened, that would just fuel my faith. How many people were exposed to the person of Christ in his earthly ministry who did not fear him? Not exposure to God's person. Not even. Not even. I want to be careful here. This is going to sound like I'm going to contradict everything that this whole study is about. Not even exposure to God's word is a guarantee that you will fear the Lord. I just wrote down a list of names. Don't turn here, just listen. Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was the son of Josiah, the young king who feared the Lord, who trembled at his word. Here is his son. Jehoiakim was the second son of Josiah who was king. The first son was deposed by Egypt, and so then they put his brother Eliakim on the throne, and they changed his name to Jehoiakim. And when we get to Jeremiah chapter 36, he is actually hearing the word of God revealed through Jeremiah, and every time another paragraph is read, he snips off the paragraph and throws it in the fire. Johanan, Je Jezariah, and all the people of the exile who remained in the land after the, um, the last major um, uh, departation to Babylon, they were in the promised land um, after 586, and they're seeking out the Lord through Jeremiah. And you can read in chapters 42 through about 45, and you can read the account of those individuals who took the, the initiative to say, Jeremiah, tell us what the Lord's going to say. And he says, okay, I'll get right back to you. And he comes back and tells them what he said. And he says, that's not the word of the Lord. They were actually exposed to the revelation of God through the prophet of Jeremiah, and they did not tremble at his word. They did not fear the Lord. The list could get quite long, and I'll just conclude my list with one last referent. The wilderness generation. The wilderness generation. You go back to the wilderness generation, they heard Moses preach. This is the generation that saw Mount Sinai. This is the generation that saw the, the plagues. This is the generation that saw the mighty works of God. This is the generation that was exposed to all sorts of of revelation, personal exposure, and the preaching of Moses. They had the oral version of Deuteronomy. They, they got the live unplugged version. The last four Shabbat sermons from Moses before they entered the promised land. They heard them. But they did not benefit from the word. Why? Hebrews 4.2 says, because their hearing was not united with faith. It wasn't united with faith. You see, Grace Bible Church, we have um, Bible as a middle name. And we have the Bible on the wall. And maybe I can charge you, this is what I want to cultivate, is every time I see that wall, I want to think, it's not enough to have it on the wall. It's not even enough to memorize it and have it in my mind. It's not enough until I tremble at it. We must tremble at God's word.
It shouldn't surprise you that your relationship to God and his word are inseparable. You cannot have a good relationship with God and a bad relationship with his word, and you cannot have a bad relationship with his word and a good relationship with God, or if I got that wrong, vice versa. You hear what I mean, not what I say. You cannot separate your relationship with God from your relationship with his word. It's one and the same. I remember one time, early on in my ministry, being called a bibliolater. A disgruntled college student said, John, all you are is a bibliolater. You worship the Bible, ink on a page. And I was picturing that. I'm like, I guess I could imagine that. I think what that would look like would be like some unique, unique form of the Bible, you know, and you, you have it on a display case with, you know, like a light shining on it, and you just bow down to it, and regardless of what it says, you're just like, I worship this object. And I can understand the temptation. I mean, I've been tempted, you know, at the John Ritblack Gallery of the British Library, right there in, this, in one room, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, and a first edition, Tyndale New Testament. Okay, that's, that's tempting. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Bibliology, what would bibliology be except, I guess, worshiping uh, a particular copy of God's word? Instead, I began to consider how synonymous our relationship with God and his word really are in the scriptures. I, I began to ask the question, can I really think too highly of God's word? Can I think so high of God's word that God himself would be displeased? And the answer is, of course, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Listen to Psalm 138, verse 2. The psalmist describes that God exalts his name. Of course, we know God exalts his name. That's, that's in about every book of the Bible. But in Psalm 138, 2, David says, I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word according to all your name. So in line with how God has magnified his name, I think reputation, he's magnified his reputation. And David is sitting there saying, and you've actually magnified your word in an equivalent way to your reputation. God is, he, he's just made a living out of glorifying himself, i.e., he's made a living out of glorifying his word. Think about that. Think about that. Christ refused to separate esteem for himself from esteem for his word. Mark 8, 38. On that last day, if you're ashamed of me or my words. You can't have a high esteem for Christ and think lowly of his words. You know, I think of a statement like that in light of the accusation of being a bibliolater, and I realize, man, you can't, you can't possibly think too highly of God's word. If you're going to call me a bibliolater because I'm worshiping an object, physical copy of God's word, that's a problem. But if you're saying that because of my devotion to what it actually says, and in my attempt to try to live it and to teach it, that is an esteem for God that he's pleased with. So... It's true to say that whatever's true of our relationship or our posture to God is also true of our relationship or posture to his word. Think about this. The scriptures describe hoping in God. Hoping in God. Now, we've spent some time in Psalm 130, and this is a good place to start. In Psalm 130, it talks about the fear of the Lord, but it says a lot more. And what it also says about a relationship to God is hope. In Psalm 130, verse 7, it says, O Israel, hope in the Lord. And we can multiply that by dozens and dozens of passages talking about hoping in the Lord. But what's interesting about Psalm 130 is that two verses earlier, it also says that it's right to hope in his word. Wow. Look at verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. In his word do I hope. Are you supposed to hope in the Lord or are you supposed to hope in his word? Yes. Think about praise. Praise the Lord. I mean, pick a psalm at random. <laughs> praise the Lord. But you know, the Bible also says, praise his word. It's modeled for us in Psalm 56. In Psalm 56, verse 
For, David says, in God, whose word I praise. He's talking about putting his trust in God. He's talking about putting his trust in God, and then he says in verse 4, I'm talking about the God whose word I praise. He doesn't just praise God, he also praises his word. Look down at verse 10, he repeats it again. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. Are you supposed to praise God or are you supposed to praise his word? Yes. What about trust? Right here in the same Psalms, Psalm 56, verse 3, I will put my trust in you, God, verse 4. And then in verse uh, 10 and 11, he says it again, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust. Trust the Lord. But Psalm 119, verse 42 also says, so I will have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. Are you supposed to trust God or are you supposed to trust his word? Yes. Second Chronicles 20, 20. Put your trust in God and you will succeed. Put your trust in his prophets. The revelation of God, what he says. Trust in that. Trust in God by trusting in what he says. I already mentioned Mark 8, 38. Esteem for God and esteem for Christ is inseparable from an esteem for his word. Your posture, your relationship to God's word is the same as your relationship to God. And so whenever anybody has ever doubted that, I like to use the analogy of marriage. Let's just try this out. In marriage, just tell your wife this afternoon, man, honey, you know what? I love you so much, but I really don't care what you say. Try that out. Give it a go. See how that works. Love for a person and love for their words, a respect and esteem for a person and a respect and esteem for their words go hand in hand. And the same is true of fear and the fear of the Lord. There is no such thing as fear of the Lord apart from trembling at his word. We have to understand that. There is no such thing as a fear of the Lord that is separate or distinct from a trembling at his word. And this is what sets apart people who are exposed to God's word from people who actually fear God. Many people have been exposed to God's word and God's revelation and did not fear the Lord. And I want to read a quote from Thomas Brooks explaining explaining this, this dilemma. This is actually in the introduction to Jeremiah's, Jeremiah Burroughs' work, Gospel Fear. And by the way, if you want the, the best single volume I've ever read on, on fear, it would be Jeremiah's, Jeremiah Burroughs' Gospel Fear. In the intro to that book, Thomas Brooks says, Ah, Christians, your hearts are never in so good a frame, so safe a frame, so sweet a frame, so happy a frame, so gospel a frame, as when they are in a trembling frame. And therefore, make this little piece your delight, your delightful companion until your hearts are brought into such a blessed frame. And he says this, objection. But don't unbelievers and devils tremble at the word? Did not Belshazzar tremble at the handwriting? Did not Felix tremble at the word preached by Paul? And is it not said that the devils believe and tremble? Answer. Wicked men and devils may tremble at the judgments denounced in the word, but they do not tremble at the offense committed against the holy commandments of God as sincere Christians do. In Ezra 10.3, Shechaniah said, We've trespassed against our Lord, our God, and let us make a covenant with our God according to the counsel of my Lord of those that tremble at the commandments of God. The commandments revealing their sin, they tremble who before were hardened in their practice of marrying with the Canaanites. But we hear nothing, we find nothing of this in Belshazzar, Felix, or the devils. And that's what sets them apart. That's what sets them apart, is the trembling and, and the, 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 the being gripped at the thought of actually not seeing conformity to this word in our hearts. I mean, 
The picture that he gives us from um, Ezra 9 and Ezra 10 is, is profound. The word of God is read in Ezra 7, and, and it's much like the revival later in Nehemiah at the building of the wall in Nehemiah 7. The word of God is read, the people are exposed to it, and in Ezra's day, they realize in the reading of the Torah, they realize that intermarriage with unbelieving, the unbelieving pagan nations in the promised land is strictly forbidden, and they've just been multiplying wives after coming back from the exile. And so here they realize we have sinned against the Lord and Ezra pulls out, he plucks out his beard, tears his clothes, and he's gripped by the thought and the fact we have displeased him. And it says in Ezra 9.3, everyone who trembled at the word gathered to me. They gathered and had a corporate trembling at the word session. It was a trembling at the word revival. They trembled at God's word, so they all came together in a corporate, public expression of their brokenness at their grief over the sin that had been committed. Everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the, gen of the exiles gathered to me, Ezra writes in chapter 9, verse 4, and I sat appalled until the evening offering. Appalled. Not some sort of fake external display of brokenness. He was appalled. Of course I had a public manifestation. That's obvious. But what's critical here is that in his heart, because he trembles at his word, he fears the Lord. This is true of all the saints. Psalm 119, 120 says, my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. Psalm 119, 161, princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. My heart stands in awe of your words. Jeremiah 23, verse 9, doesn't use the word tremble, it doesn't use the word fear, but it does use the word tremble. It says, as for the prophets, my heart is broken within me, all my bones tremble. I've become like a drunken man, even like a man overcome with wine because of the Lord and because of his words. It's inseparable. Because of the Lord and because of his words. How should we read the Bible? How should we read the Bible? Well, I remember reading the account of Herodotus giving the account of how um, the Medo-Persians laid siege on Babylon. Babylon was supposed to be in, have an impenetrable city, an impenetrable fortress. and describes how they had begun building a dam upstream, and this, the river ran through the city. And uh, they had been building this dam upstream, and they knew that uh, the last linchpin to actually cut off all the flow of the river, they were waiting until nightfall. And then they dammed up the river entirely so that by you know, midnight, there would be no water running into the city. And the entire army marched in through the river, going under the, the aqueduct where the water came in under the city. And they marched in the very night, that, as Daniel records, they're partying and drunken, and everybody was having a celebration. And, and the king is saying, I'm king, no one can touch me, I, I'm, I'm king forever. And then he got killed that night. And Herodotus tells the story of how the military pulled it off. Of course, the military was nothing more than a pawn in the hands of God. But I was just thinking about that story, and I was thinking about how those soldiers would have listened to their commands from their superiors. Every detail had to be precise. You have to coordinate efforts between various battalions and various companies of soldiers in various locations, and then other people who are taking care of the engineering of the dam upstream and the timing and the coordination of all of it to pull it off. You think about how intense they would have been listening to those commandments, and it has to be carried out with precision exactly as given. This isn't entertainment. This isn't mere habit. This isn't exposure for the sake of just knowing some information. It has to be acted upon with complete compliance and unity and conformity to what is given by way of command. Think of the um, intensity that you would listen 
Now, this won't, this won't apply to all the pilots in the room. I am not a pilot. But whenever I fly, sometimes, you know, my, I don't have the most disciplined mind. And I like to daydream. And so some, often when I'm, when I'm uh, flying, I, I often imagine, you know, like, man, what if, the, uh, what, if the, what if the pilot just, like, got sick or died? And there, there was no pilot. And, like, every, nobody was willing to volunteer. And I had to land this thing. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know how I get there. But I, I get there. I get there to these crazy places in my mind. And I picture, you know, getting on the, uh, you know, on the air, getting in contact with air traffic control. I don't, even, I don't even know how to contact air traffic control. But let's say I pulled that off. And I've got air traffic control in my, my headgear, and I'm landing a plane for the first time with hundreds of passengers. How would you listen to the, that information? Yeah, that's fascinating. You know what? I think I'm going to do it a different way. <laughs> You'd be hanging on every word. Now, you know, which button? Which, the, how, how far do I pull the yoke? What do I do? I'd be terrified. should read the Bible like Martin Luther read it at age 20. Age 20. He's studying law at the University of Erfurt. He's buried in the the library of the university. At 20 years old, still an unbeliever, was the first time he found a copy of the Bible because he was one of the few Germans who knew Latin fluently enough to read it. He finds this book in the library, and I'm, I'm going to read you the account of when he first got exposed to the Bible, because what shocked him, he had no idea that there was that much material. His only knowledge of the Bible was from the Mass, and there was lectionary readings. Lectionary would be a term to just, it's, a, it's, an, it's prescribed reading, so every Sunday of, of the calendar year has a lectionary reading. All that Luther knew was in the Bible were 52 lectionary readings. That's it. So to realize there were 66 books, let alone how many chapters in those books, was a marvel to him. The historian Dubinier records it this way. He says, books were as yet rare, and it was a great privilege for him to profit by the treasures brought together in this vast collection. Talk about the library there at the university. One day, he had then been two years at Erfurt and was 20 years old. He opens many books in the library, one after another, to learn their writers' names. One volume that he uh, comes to attracts his attention. He has never until this hour seen its like. He reads the title. It is a Bible. A rare book, unknown in those times. His interest is greatly excited. He is filled with astonishment at finding other matters than those fragments of the Gospels and epistles that the church has selected to be read to the people during public worship every Sunday throughout the year. Until this day, he had imagined that they composed the whole Word of God, and now he sees so many pages, so many chapters, so many books of which he had no idea. His heart beats as he holds the divinely inspired volume in his hand. With eagerness and with indescribable emotion, he turns over these leaves from God. Not yet knowing not yet knowing he didn't even know the gospel. Knowing that this is the only source of light he's ever been exposed to. I want to turn your attention to a few texts that show the fear of the Lord comes only from the word. We'll start in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is the conclusion to Moses' first sermon. It starts in chapter 1, goes through chapter 4. Uh, there's four sermons recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. And, and, the conclu- and the conclusion here of this first sermon, in chapter 4, verse 1, he's addressing the nation. He says, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of our fathers, is giving you. Verse 2, do not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I am commanding you. He's, he's, he's hemming it in. This is the Old Testament equivalent to the proverb that Paul records, the do not transgress what is written. Do not go beyond what is written principle. Solomon, I mean, Deut- <laughs> Moses starts that principle right here in Deuteronomy 4. Don't go beyond what's written, and don't stop short of it. 
He's hemming in the exclusivity of the scriptures here because where he's going is that you need to obey these commandments. Verse 6, keep and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. I mean, that is the mission statement of the nation of Israel. The church has a, has, has a mission statement of go to all the nations. It's arrows pointing out from the church to the nations. The, missions, the great commission for Israel is be so holy that the nations come to you. Arrows pointing to the nation of Israel. If Israel, as a nation, corporately, universally, feared God, the conditions of the covenant would be fulfilled and all the nations would say, there is no God like the God of Israel. And that has not yet happened. But that is their mission statement. Keep these commands and that's your wisdom, that's your understanding. Then we're going to say, what great God is there like the God of Israel, verse 7, and same in verse 8. What nation, what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I'm setting before you today? Maybe the closest they ever came was under Solomon when the Queen of Sheba came to visit and says, there's no God like your God. Verse 9. Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. So familiarity and knowledge of the word, and passing it on to generation to generation to generation, so that they can obey and give heed to it, that's the critical element. It's not being exposed to the word, it's giving heed to the word. That's the difference. Verse 10. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people to me, that I may let them hear my words. Why why, why, why assemble the people? It's a purpose statement. So they can hear my words. And what's the purpose of hearing these words? And as he says in verse 9, giving heed to these words? So that they may learn to fear me all the days They live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. That's the reason God gave his word, is so that it could be heeded, so that we could fear him and tremble at his words. The fear of the Lord only comes from God's word. Skip over to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17 is this fantastic charge given to the kings of Israel, and every king of Israel is supposed to have a handwritten, personally handwritten copy of the law so that he could read God's word daily. Verse 18, Deuteronomy 17, verse 18, look at what it says. It shall come about when he, the king of Israel, sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. So it's so important. He needs to be able to have handwritten every word, and he's going to do it in the, in, the, in the presence of Levitical priests who can document and confirm the accuracy that this is actually the word of the Lord that he's copied. Now, verse 19. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes. Think about this for a second. He can never fear the Lord without the scriptures. But he also could be exposed to the Torah and still not fear the Lord. It's not enough to have the scriptures, to have a copy of them. And it's not even enough in this text to read them daily. It's Only enough when you give heed and carefully observe everything it says. We must tremble at his word, and that means fear the Lord by doing what he says. Don't be a hearer of the word who deludes himself. Be a fearer of the word. I'll say it that way. I'll impose all this study into the James passage. Don't be a mere hearer of the word who deludes himself. Be a fearer of the word. Skip over to Deuteronomy 31. 
We get toward the end of Moses' last sermon here. In chapter 31... He's, he, he's, he starts speaking back in verse 2, but there's a little interlude here where he's talking about um, um, Moses, uh, jo- uh, Joshua being the, uh, the leader, and he's charging him to be strong and courageous as the leader. In verse 9, Deuteronomy 31, verse 9, it says, So Moses wrote this law, he gave it to the priests and the sons of Levi who carried the ark of the covenant and the Lord to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the time of the year of remission of debts, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God, at the place which he will choose. Okay, pause right there. So they don't even know where they're going to end up. I mean, they haven't even arrived in in Jerusalem. And for several years, the tabernacle was in Shiloh. So that's all future still. But the charge here is, okay, every year you have a Feast of Booths. But at the end of the Feast of Booths, on the seventh year, so this is the Feast of Booths celebrated at the the, um, the, the year of rest, the the, the year of of, of Shabbat, every seven years they would rest. That year, you're going to assemble for the Feast of Booths, and when you do it at that particular year, verse 11b says, you shall read this law in front of all Israel in their hearing. Now, that's impressive. The entire nation would gather to Jerusalem every year for the Feast of Booths and imagine the oral recitation of the, of the Law of Moses. Five books. I mean, how long does that take? And there's anticipation. And there's excitement when it was observed, which was only a handful of times in the history of the Old Testament. So in honor of that, we're going to go ahead and stand. I'm going to read the entire Torah, and I'm just kidding. I mean, just think about that for a second. That's impressive. Every, every seven years, they would read the book of the law of Moses. That's what they were supposed to do. Assemble the people, the men, and the women, and the children, and the alien who is in your town. That would be foreigners who moved to Israel because they worship Yahweh as the one true God of the universe. And so these are the faithful. These are the people of God. Everyone, assemble everyone, so that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe all the words of this law. Three times. Now we got a hat trick just from the book of Deuteronomy. Fearing the Lord comes from the word. Now with the time that we have left, let's look at the classic text of what it means to tremble at God's word. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66. And we're going to We're going to end here, and I'm going to give you a couple of uh, exhortations about what it means to tremble at God's word. Isaiah 66, conclusion of this incredible book, starting in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. As far as I remember, and if Alec Moyer, the commentator on Isaiah, is correct, this is the only time in the Bible, the earth is actually called his footstool. The temple is his footstool. The Ark of the Covenant is his footstool. This pictures the entire inhabited world as the footstool of God. And footstool obviously has a position and picture of dominion. If you go back to Joshua at the conquest, there would be pagan kings who would fight against the nation of Israel, and Joshua would put his foot on their necks, and then they would kill them, and that would show dominion. All of man's entire inhabited existence is the footstool of God Almighty. The, the picture here is just the immense, infinite scope of God's bigness for lack of a better word. If he sits on the heavens and puts his feet on the earth, where is a house you could build for me? What could possibly contain God? Where would God dwell? I mean, the heavens aren't even where he dwells. That's where he sits. So you picture all of the created heavens and the expanse of everything, and that's where God sits. And then he just puts his feet on earth. 
So then where would he dwell? Where could, where could he actually, where, would, where could he inhabit? Where could he find a home? Where would he dwell comfortably? Verse 2, for my hand made all these things. I mean, I created all this stuff. Where, am I, I going to create something that would actually contain me? Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But, but to this one I will look. Okay? Before we get to the very familiar refrain here, appreciate the context afresh. Because he's asking a question, where can I dwell? Where does God dwell comfortably? God only dwells comfortably in a heart that trembles at his word. Now look at the refrain, look at the familiar part of this verse in the second half of verse 2. But to this one I will look. Here's the one I will look to. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Humble means lowly. Humble. Humble does not mean timidity. Humble doesn't mean soft-spoken. Humble doesn't mean not assertive. Humble doesn't mean spineless. Humble means, here's God slash his word. I am infinitely below that, always. Whatever it says is true. Whatever I would have disagreed with, I'm the liar. Let God be true. That's humility. That's humility. It's the encounter of a human conscience and a human heart coming under superiority. Truth itself. Oh, I would never have said it that way. Then I better start saying it that way. I wouldn't have agreed with that conclusion. Well, then I better start agreeing with that conclusion. That's not true. No, nope, I'm the liar. That is humility. Promise of God. I believe it. Fact of God. It's true. Warning, I'm going to heed it. Command, I am going to do it. Not because I'm up for the task, but because I'm going to rely on his grace to accomplish it. That's what it means to be humble. Contrite of spirit. Contrite. Small and broken. Contrite of spirit. You know, you think about when you read the scriptures, are you contrite? I remember, um, I remember my uh, uh, growing up years. I remember dad, my, the, the, the legacy that my dad left me was every morning that he was there when I, when I woke up, which was, you know, often I woke up like five minutes before school started. But nevertheless, on those days that I got up in time for actually, to actually eat breakfast, there would be my dad sitting in his chair, reading the scriptures. I remember one time, he came into the living room and he just said, and I think he'd been saved, I think I remember him saying he'd been reading the Bible for 40 years. He'd been for, saved 40 years at that point. And he said, man, this book is just bottomless. I've read this thing for 40 years and I've never exhausted its riches. What a legacy. I was talking to my friend, Matias. He's a pastor in Buenos Aires, Argentina, I've gone down there and ministered with him, and I remember his, him describing a similar legacy. He, he said that one of the strongest means that God used in his own conversion was the fact that as a kid, he would watch his parents, who were also evangelists in Buenos Aires, he would watch them weep when they read the Bible. They would weep over their own sin. This is the one to whom God looks, to him who was broken and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. When God speaks, there's a consuming fear of disregarding his word, of not seeing it come to fruition, of not seeing it played out. The cry of the person who trembles at God's word ought to be, Lord, may your will be done in my heart as it is in heaven. We just have a few minutes here. Let's continue real quick. Verse 3. But he who kills an ox is like the one who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like the one who breaks a dog's neck. 
He who offers a grain offering is like one who offers swine's blood. He who burns incense is like one who blesses an idol. They have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. Okay, I'm going to keep reading, but I know what you're asking. What a radical transition. What a lack of transition. It's a re- there's a reason why we're probably more familiar with verse 2 and not verses 2 through 5. Let me keep reading. I understand that tension. I'm just I'm trying to acknowledge that I recognize it. Let's keep reading. Verse 4. So I will choose their punishments and will bring on them what they dread because I called but no one answered. I spoke but they did not listen and they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. He's describing a lack of response to his word. He's describing the opposite of trembling at his word. He's describing people who are externally conforming to what God's word says without a heart that trembles at his word. So here they are. They're doing the sacrifice. They're going through the motions. They've got the week-in, week-out schedule, uh, the, uh, the Shabbat sacrifice, the morning and evening sacrifice. They go to the Feast of Booths every, every year, and this every seven years. They rest. And they could even, perhaps, listen to the entire reading of the Law of Moses. But they have chosen their own way. Because they are not in their inner man, trembling at God's word, all of their sacrificial offerings are perfunctory and displeasing to God. Now, look at verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. You see the refrain there? It becomes clear that verses 3 through 4 are a foil or an opposite to trembling at his word. This is the external carrying out of the commands of God without the heart that trembles at his word. Now, verse 5, he goes back to those who tremble at his word, and he says to them, Hear the the, the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you, who exclude you for my namesake, have said, Let the Lord be glorified and and we will see your joy, but they will be put to shame. You see what's happening here? He's speaking directly to those who tremble at his word, and your brothers would be those in Israel, brothers who are part of the people of God in a visible way, who are carrying out the externals of God's word, but don't tremble at his word. And they're taunting the person who actually trembles at God's word. They're taunting you. They've got the externals. Who are you? So concerned about pleasing the Lord, you're a man, you got all these scruples. Take God so literally, hyper literalist, legalist. All those accusations start flying, and they're sitting there saying, The Lord will be glorified and, and we'll see your joy. And it, it's, a, it's a vain confidence. And they're mocking this person who trembles at his word, and they actually exclude him. Listen. Fear of the Lord and trembling at his word are often going to exclude you from some of the most visible and externally pious people. But what guides them and what guards them is what God has said. And so I want to just, I want want Isaiah 66 in your mind as I say this. I'm I'm going to give you a few concluding exhortations. There's a way to read the Bible that does not promote fear of the Lord, and there's a way to read the Bible that constitutes fear of the Lord. We've seen that. We've seen the negative and the positive in those texts. Let me just exhort you. Read the word with brokenness and contrition. Read it with brokenness and contrition. Psalm 119, verse 136 says, My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. The, the, the better mark of do you fear the Lord or not is, is not do you know the Bible and can you recite it. I've counseled people who can quote scripture better than I can, whose lives are in shambles. The question is not whether you can recite it. The, the better question is are you broken at any and every lack of conformity to what it says? Secondly, call out for it cry out for it. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed. It's probably my, if I have a favorite verse. Psalm 119, verse 38. Establish, and the word is literally in the Hebrew, cause to stand. Cause to stand. So I'll I'll say it that way. Cause your word to stand 
for your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Cause your word to stand. Make it the foundation, the fulcrum, the launch point, the Cape Canaveral of all of my fear of, the Lord, of, the, of you. Cause that to be your word. Proverbs 2 says, cry out for it. Of course, it says cry out properly for discernment, but that's akin to the fear of the Lord as we saw last time. Read with brokenness. Call out for it. Number three, act on it. If you equip yourself with the word and you continue to act in a way that would displease the Lord, you're creating a habit of religious hypocrisy. Such a habit will not be immediately visible to the people of God, but it will be immediately visible to God. So, instead of being a mere hearer of the word, be one who trembles at his word. Read it with brokenness, call out for it, act on it. Lord, we're so thankful for this time, and just, again, we're so thankful for your word, and thankful even for your timing, that we would study what it means to um, grow in a fear of you, and, and the only source of the fear of you is your word. And on the, very, on the very day that we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of this church, and on the very first Sunday that we have the Bible hung on the, on the hallway out leading into the sanctuary, and so, Lord, we're just thankful, so thankful for your word. And I want to just maybe pray and cry out in a way that would be reminiscent of Ezra. And just acknowledge, Lord, as your people, corporately, we want to cry out to you and acknowledge there are no doubt many ways where we have not trembled at your word. Where we have gone astray and we've done what's right in our own eyes and where we have been negligent, indifferent. Lord, it's bad enough to be unaware of what your word would entail, but it's even worse to um, deliberately cross lines that your word has told us not to cross. To go against what you've said and to say no to your will for our lives. And so, Lord, we come to you as your church and we just cry out that Lord, we need your grace and we need your spirit. We long for you to establish your word as the very thing that would produce a reverence for you. And if ever a church would be marked by a fear of you, I pray that it would be this one. Um, and we, we don't pray that to make anything of ourselves. We pray that only to make something of you. In your name we pray. Amen.